first off before this show, a bit of a disclaimer. For the past five years, I've been averaging maybe one drink a month. As much as anything, moving to China and seeing how binge drinking isn't a part of a lot of young people's social lives opened my mind up to the fact that you don't actually need booze to loosen up and enjoy yourself. So for all the impressionable youth out there, I just want to say drinking in moderation or not drinking at all is cool. With that, I'd like to welcome to the show Derek Sandhouse, author of Drunken China, formerly of Capital Spirits, and co-founder of Ming River Baijiu. Since I kicked us off with that introduction, maybe we'll start talking a little bit about your exploration of the history of AA in China, Alcoholics Anonymous. What does that look like in China, and how does the model fit and not quite fit into the Chinese context? There's a few things right off the bat. I know Alcoholics Anonymous as a program, some people find it very helpful, and whoever does you know, draw a benefit from being a part of that program, uh, I say that's great. But there are a lot of people who view it as somewhat less than scientific in its approach. Some of its core principles rely on religious belief, which is a non-starter in China. And it's not something that I think has a lot of buy-in at the larger scale in China. So there are very few chapters of Alcoholics Anonymous, mostly in larger cities. And generally, they're only around places that have uh, bigger like addiction treatment centers. For most of China, there's not like an AA chapter that they have access to and some of the other kind of like more modern scientific approaches to treating what is it alcohol use disorder is the current term replacing alcoholism that is not something that china has invested a lot in or, or has many options for people so that that is an area where there could be a lot of improvement i would say let's Take it back a few dynasties. But before we dive deeper into the rise of Baijiu, I want to talk a little bit about the, the history of alcohols in China. You spent a fair amount of time on this in your book, taking it you know, back thousands of years. But maybe we can start with Li Bai and Fu. What were the famous poets getting drunk under the moonlight drinking? Because it wasn't 80 proof alcohol, was it? No, no. So when you go back to the classical Tang Dynasty, pre-Tang Dynasty poets, what they're drinking is going to be some version of Huangzhou, the like just distilled Chinese grain wine. It's usually a bit sweeter, usually tops off at about, you know, 10 to 15 percent alcohol by volume, three or four times at least less potent than Baijiu. What they were drinking would not have gotten people quite as incapacitatedly drunk as people do at Baijiu banquets today. So Derek, what happened to bring distilled liquor into China? Yeah, so we don't totally know, because for the first uh, thousand or year or so history of distilled spirits or Baijiu in China, we're looking at a period from about like 1100 to the 20th century where Baijiu is considered very much like a peasant's drink, something that farmers, workers, laborers drank, but the kind of the poets, the writers, the bureaucratic elite of China was not largely consuming Baijiu. So there was very little written about it during this period, and there's very little records that we have of its origins in China. But just uh, based on the anecdotal evidence we have, we know that the early Chinese histories of distilled spirits say that it arrived around the Yuan dynasty. And there's some evidence that it showed up slightly before then during, during the Song dynasty. So both of these were periods in which China had large trade with the Middle East and Central Asia. So we think that these regions, which already had distilled spirits, that technology migrated to China and met with an alcohol-producing culture that had existed for thousands of years and became something new, Baijiu, by around the Ming Dynasty. So let's take us... Let's take us past the Ming. So what was this sort of adoption process of, of harder liquor in China? So it was slow and gradual. As distillation traveled around China, it became several different drinks. So what we call Baijiu today is actually a category that includes at least 12 different distinct types of liquor. So what they call Baijiu in Beijing is a completely different drink than what they call Baijiu in Sichuan. 
but there are certain commonalities between the two. All baijos, for example, are distilled from grain. All of them are fermented and distilled in a solid form using a fermentation agent called chu that's been around for at least 3,000 years. And the adoption, like I said, it was originally considered a like rough and tumble peasants drink because most baijo then and now is made with sorghum which is not used in many Chinese dishes. The rice wine that was more popular with the ancient Chinese elite, that would have been coming from rice, which was quite precious during China's famine-prone years. Whereas sorghum was used for other things, some food products, mostly though animal feed, they used it to make brooms with. So it was a cheaper grain to make alcohol with, and baijiu is very strong, so a, a little bit of it goes a long way. It was value primarily that made it a, a like people's drink, so to speak. And it wasn't really until the 20th century that China became a, a people's republic and the role of the peasant was elevated to the forefront that it became considered the national alcoholic drink of China. That's fascinating. I, I want to stay on Huangyo just for one more second. So is the closest people can get to the Libai drink is sake nowadays? Like how has that sort of rice wine lived on into the present day? There's a few different drinks that they make from fermented rice or millet in China. The oldest drinks in China used more millet than rice, and that changed about 2,000 years ago. So there's Huangzhou that you can get like in uh, Shaoxing, like near near Shanghai. That is probably the closest to what was being consumed about a thousand years ago. There's also other drinks. There's this drink called Chojo, which is a type of Huangzhou that's made around Xi'an, and that might be closer to what Li Bai was drinking. There's also like a clear sweet Guangzhou that they just call Mijo, rice alcohol, that's quite popular in southeastern China, particularly in like Guangxi and Guangdong. There were, in the times of Li Bai, just from the records and the catalog alcohol production at the time, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of different types of Guangzhou that they drank back then. Any one of these drinks, I think, would resemble something that was available at the time. Coming back to where you left us off with the CCP and Baijiu, how did the party institutionalize this alcohol and give it sort of the place that it, it currently has in China today? There were several reasons that led to a widespread adoption of Baijiu in the early years of the CCP. The first one was just a uh, preference. Like the favorite drink Zhou Enlai was uh, Guizhou Mao Tai. And that was during the long march, supposedly the, the People's Liberation Army crossed the Churchway River in Mao Tai seven or eight times, I think. And while they were there, they tried the Baijo, supposedly used it to clean out their wounds. And it, it became this drink that was associated with the successful Chinese revolution. He made that the official drink that was served at state dinners in the 1950s. And it's been the state drink ever since. So that, that was one of the reasons. Beijing, where the capital was set up, was one of the bigger Baijiu drinking regions of the country up to that point. And so much so that the first business license issued in the People's Republic of China was the Red Star Arguato Distillery which many people have tried and some of them even like it. But that was one thing. And it was also just an issue of China as it was industrializing during this period was looking to promote national products, things that were identifiably Chinese and popular with the working people. Many of what we would consider the biggest distilleries in China today were set up by the government going to places that were producing a lot of baijiu and consolidating all of the distilleries into large state-run operations that all of the big distilleries today came out of that period. Guizhou Mao Tai, Wuliang Ye, Lujo La Jiao, Red Star Arguato, those are all distilleries started during this period of time. Let's talk about the varieties of baijiu itself. You hinted about this earlier in the conversation, and even the state owned ones that you just listed all are not making the same exact thing. So, so what's driving the variety and flavors and maybe you know, pick out a few of your favorites uh, or, or ones that are most distinctive and tied to their, I guess, home 
regions or provinces? Sure. So one of the things that the government did when it was greatly expanding the baijiu industry and setting up these state-run distilleries is that they began in the 1950s to catalog the different styles of baijiu that were made in different parts of the country. And they did several successive, I, I don't know what you would call them, like national meetings where they discussed the varieties of baijiu. And so the first one, they set up four different styles of baijiu that they thought encapsulated the universe of baijiu. And those were what they called fun fun style the, from like a funjo, which is a distillery in Shanxi. And they did a uh, Phoenix Aroma, which came from the like uh, Shifeng West Phoenix distillery in near Xi'an. And they had Lu Aroma from Lu Zhou Lao Zhao and Mao Aroma from Guizhou Mao Tai. And that, those were the four types of Baijiu. But then the more they looked into it, the more they explored, they discovered there were actually quite a bit more distilleries than those four styles. And also they noticed that by naming the styles after specific distilleries, they were favoring one distillery in a region over all of the others. <laughs> so they made the names in general more generic, like Mao Aroma became Sauce Aroma by Joe and Lu Aroma became Strong Aroma by Joe and Fun Aroma became Light Aroma. Phoenix Aroma, for whatever reason, stayed Phoenix Aroma. but Because it had the best name. And everyone knows immediately what a phoenix smells like, so it's <laughs> a good descriptor. But yeah, so th they did that, and they've been gradually expanding that. Like Most of the distilleries that have been added to this in later years are just like very small uh, niche styles of Baijiu that are riffs on these like original few styles. The only major addition to those initial four was Rice Aroma by Joe, which constitutes a pretty large region of southeastern China that, that makes its by Joe from rice rather than sorghum primarily. But otherwise, you have stuff like Sesame Aroma, you have Medicinal Aroma, you have other things that are made using very specialized productions but are, are, are fairly limited to just a handful of distilleries. So... Which of these are maybe the most appealing to a Western palate? And can you describe the few that have maybe prejudiced the masses against, or the Western masses against the whole category? Yeah, so I think that the most approachable style of Baijiu to someone who is not a big drinker of Baijiu or even other liquors is probably Rice Aroma Baijiu, which we trace back to the like Guilin region in Guangxi. And in this style of Baijiu, it's very light, it's very mild. I'd say it's very comparable in, in its flavor and smell to like sake or vodka even. Soju is a pretty good comparison. But this style of Baijiu, yeah, it's just very light. It's easy to drink. It's oftentimes like bottled at a lighter strength than some of the other styles tend to be. And then I find after that, the most popular style of Baijiu in China is also relatively approachable, I would say. And that's a strong aroma Baijiu, which comes from Sichuan. And that tends to be like really bright and fruity. And, and it has a lot of flavors, but they're familiar flavors that are, are more appealing, like pineapple, licorice, things like that. And then I would say sauce aroma baijiu, though considered one of the best in China, is very difficult for people not familiar with Asian flavors, particularly like the Asian flavors of the kitchen, because sauce aroma refers to soy sauce, and that's the style that Guizhou Mao Tai makes. And it tends to be very savory and very umami like mushroom, nuts, chocolate, coffee, things that are very bitter, seemingly, and there's not as much sweetness in there. So that that is a challenging flavor profile to a lot of people. And then light aroma of the, the, the fourth of the major four styles, that is, I would say it's quite difficult for some if you do drinking a lot of like Western spirits, particularly like European clear spirits, like Northern European schnapps, brandies, uh, stuff like grappa 
I think it's relatively approachable, but for most people, it can be a bit like bitter, crisp, a, a little weird. Most people will get a bad feeling for Light Aroma Baijiu because of the Beijing Arguato style of Light Aroma Baijiu, which tends to be very inexpensive. Like a bottle of Red Star Arguato sells for less than the price of a bottle of water in a lot of convenience stores in China. Sure. And... What I like to tell people is I don't think Arguato is bad. Try to find a bottle of liquor that is better for a dollar a bottle. But at the same time, a dollar a bottle is not going to get you very high quality spirit. Talking about sort of like which liquors turn off Westerners, it reminds me of this story. Fuchsia Dunlop, the famous cookbook author, back in the early 90s, took a handful of Sichuan's leading Chinese chefs to the West and took them all around California. They went to Chez Panisse and all the best restaurants that, that the West Coast had to offer. And their reactions to it were fascinating. So this was, the 90s were not necessarily a time in which you had really many Western ingredi- Western specialty ingredients in China. And just like, even people who were interested in food didn't necessarily have a ton of exposure to Western flavors. And these chefs, they... They see this fancy blue cheese and they're like, this is gross. They see red wine and they're like, this is gross. They see heavy dessert after a big meal and they have no idea what's going on. And then they get annoyed that there's no rice to fill them up at the end of the meal. These kind of taste disconnects work in both ways, right? It's not, there's nothing like inherently odd about the the baijiu flavors that Westerners don't tend to tend to take to it's more just because clearly there are tens of millions of people who enjoy this drink right there's nothing about like humanity that will not take to these products but it's such a product of the sort of flavors you were exposed to as a kid you have this riff about scotch whiskey being something that not many people necessarily enjoyed on their first sip but has enough of a sort of culture and mystique around it that people are going to have that fifth tenth twentieth taste of this stuff and eventually will acquire a an appreciation of the of the sort of work that goes into these fancy single malts. Yeah, absolutely. And this was principally one of the reasons I got interested in Baijiu and wanted to know more about it because it's one of those subjects if you take an informal survey of what people think about Baijiu among your average group of expatriates in China, you're going to get mostly very violently negative reactions. People talking about how gross it is, how it's rocket fuel, how it's disgusting, it's the worst thing they've ever tasted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, the fact of the matter is it's a drink that is loved and enjoyed by tens if not hundreds of millions of people. And there has to be something that they're appreciating in it. You can really assume two things if you think that you don't enjoy the taste of Baijiu, and that is either you don't understand the flavors, you don't understand what the producers of Baijiu are trying to make, or that this huge group of people is somehow wrong. And I I just don't think it follows that people would do something that they don't enjoy if if there wasn't more to it than than your understanding. Yes, it is something I think that people can fairly easily learn to gain an appreciation for, but it's something that is, you're very unlikely to enjoy the, the first few times you taste it. It, it just, like anything, it, it requires the cultivation of a taste. So you've done more than talk about this. You've spent a number of years of your professional career trying to attack this this problem. So before we come back to it, let's talk a little bit about Ming River Baijiu and how you decided to create your own brand and try to bring it to the West. I, I guess first off, like, what was the balance of motivation between this is a market opportunity, this is something you're passionate about? Why did you end up deciding that this was a good idea? It was really a combination of all of the things you raise. For me, I had this problem when I published my first book about Baijo. This was in 2014, Baijo, The Essential Guide to Chinese Spirits. At that time, I was one of the only people in the world writing about Baijo in a serious way in English. And I wanted to share what I had started to appreciate about this spirit with my global peers in the spirits industry. But you had this problem of availability. You can 
buy baijiu anywhere and in great variety in China, but outside of a few, a handful of Chinatown liquor stores in Europe and the United States, it's almost impossible to find baijiu in a liquor store. So even though I wanted to share this knowledge with people, there wasn't really any way that people could act upon it. I had hoped that someone would take up the charge and successfully launch a Baijiu brand in the West and that I could continue telling people about it that way, but I didn't see people doing it in either a way that I thought was going to be successful or a way that I thought was a totally respectful to the product and, and its heritage. There were several people around 2010, 2011, who were getting into the international market with Baijiu brands, but they were starting from the premise that Baijiu is something that Westerners won't like unless it's made more like attractive or palatable to them. So they were doing things like having a Western distiller's filter and add flavors to Baijiu to make it friendly for non-Chinese people. But for me, I didn't think that was really celebrating what made Baijiu great. Over the years after I published that book, many people reached out to me, either Westerners who were planning to take Baijiu out of China and try to sell it in the West, or Chinese companies that were looking for assistance in marketing their product to either younger Chinese or to international audiences. And around 2016, there was an opportunity with me and a couple of people I started a consultancy with in Beijing to go into business with one of China's biggest distilleries, uh, Lujo La Jiao. And that seemed like too good an opportunity to pass up. So how did you guys, so once you had the arrangement, how did you think about the fra flavor profile and price point when making your first product for the Western market? Price point's an incredibly important consideration when you are launching a new product into the market. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why Baijo had struggled for many years before the launch of Ming River. Because when Chinese distilleries in the past had tried to sell their products overseas, they viewed that as they were representing Baijo and by extension China around the world. So they wanted the world to have the best, but the best Baijo sell in China for hundreds of dollars a bottle, which is enough to scare away most casual drinkers from ever trying your product. So what we started with is we just did some basic market research, knew the kind of places, the bars, the restaurants that we wanted to sell Ming River to, and found out like what price worked for them. So we came down with about like 35 US dollars retail. And then we worked backwards from that. How could we get the best bottle? How could we get the best liquid? How could we make the best product around the price point we knew we needed? Yeah. And that right away has helped us considerably over over previous Baijiu's tried to sell it into the U.S. market. Sure. So where did you land at in terms of which style? Rice Baijiu by far is the least objectionable style of Baijiu to either new drinkers of Baijiu or people who don't drink a lot of liquor to begin with because it's very mild and approachable. But what we found when we did sample tastings with bartenders in places like New York City and Berlin with Rice Aroma Baijo was they said, yeah, this is fine. I enjoy drinking this, but it doesn't have a lot of flavor. So it's not going to add anything that I don't really have from other less expensive drinks like vodka to, to my back bar. Whereas drinks like Strong Aroma Baijo, Sauce Aroma Baijo were more exciting to bartenders because they knew right off the bat this was unlike any other drink that they had at their bar and that they could get new combinations of flavor out of their mixed drinks with it. And between Strong Aroma and Sauce Aroma, Sauce Aroma is much more challenging, I think, to the uninitiated Baijo palate. We thought Strong Aroma had a good chance, and Lujo Lao Jiao, when they reached out to us, was like pretty much, I think, the best possible partner we could look for in the Strong Aroma Baijo market, because Lujo Lao Jiao is 
considered to be the like inheritor of the creator of Strong Aroma Baijo. They have parts of their distillery that date back to the late 16th century and just have this wonderful heritage and products that I, I can say without, without lying <laughs> to you. I was drinking Lujo Lao Jiao Baijo's when I was living in Chengdu just casually. That was my go-to Baijo for an inexpensive, just nice dinner by Joe with friends. I would pick up a 100, 150 Kwai bottle of Lujo Lao Jiao when I was just headed out to the restaurant with my friends and we would yeah. split it and we'd all enjoy it. It was easy to drink. We, and we, should give some, we should give some context that you are you are married to a foreign service officer who was stationed at the embassy in Chengdu, which of course now is closed for the time being. We'll see if Biden can um, can change that sort of thing. But what a shame for China had they closed this 15 years earlier and, and not had the cultural ambassador that you've now since turned into, Derek. It's funny you bring that up. One of my last Baijiu tastings that I did in Chengdu was at the was with the Chengdu Baijiu Club. And there were a lot of people, including the consul general at the Chengdu consulate there. And I, I think there is a much greater appreciation for Baijiu today in in, in China than, than when I was there, at least among the expatriate community. It, it is a lost opportunity. And I'm sorry that that is not open anymore. Let's talk a little. I'm, I'm curious about the, the price point issue. Like, where does Mingming Revaiju fit into the offerings of the parent company? And, like, what happens $15 cheaper? And what happens when you get into the $100, $200, $300 bottles of this stuff? Sure. Not to get overly technical, but a little bit of the production needs to be discussed here when we're talking about a strong aroma baijo. So strong aroma baijo is usually made from sorghum or sorghum mixed with other grains. And it's fermented in these large like mud pits that are dug out of the ground that hold like 20 to 30 tons of grain. And they bury them in there for about two to three months at a time. And why that's important is that this style of baijo depends on using these mud pits over and over again so that over time they develop the patina of microorganisms that become part of the fermentation process and give the drink its distinctive flavor. So for strong aroma, they say you need to use a fermentation pit for at least three years uh, before you can start selling the baijiu as qu a quality product. And then pits that are at least 30 to 100 years old are what's used in the highest quality of strong aroma baijiu. Two things are going into the different levels of product that are sold at our distillery. All of the baijos are blended from stuff taken from different pits. And also the stuff that the, like the grain mash you get at the top of the pit tends to be drier and less desirable in, in the baijo it produces than the grain at the bottom of the pit. So you have both different qualities of baijo produced from different pits and different qualities of baijo produced from mash taken from different parts of the pit. And all of this is blended together. So the more expensive products are using the best baijo from the oldest pits. And the cheaper baijos will be using more of the less desirable baijo from the less desirable pits. And the cheapest stuff, the stuff that sells for just a few dollars for a bottle, that stuff will be blended with some like neutral grain spirits, like uh, essentially blended with vodka. So that it's not even 100% like b traditionally produced baijo. So that's the main difference. Our baijo, I would say, is solidly in the mid-range, a little bit cheaper than ours in China. You get a brand called... Uh, Tochu, which is like the head chew, and the like slightly more expensive, it's what's called a Tochu, a special chew. And either of those products is fairly comparable. What really separates Ming River from either of those two brands of Lujo Lao Jiao products, which I would recommend to anyone, is that we worked long and hard with the blender to get a blend that we thought could work for a variety of purposes. So we did taste tests of several different blends that highlighted different parts of the flavor profile of a strong aroma baijo, mostly with bartenders in New York. 
and we take four samples, A, B, C, and D, have them taste all four of them, and maybe 50% said we like A, and 50% said they like C, then we would take that feedback back to the blender and say we got 50% A, 50% C. And then she would go back and make four different blends that highlighted those flavors until we narrowed down something that we knew was something that bartenders would find really easy to work with in a cocktail, but was still something that if you just poured it neat at a banquet with a nice hot pot meal, it would be perfectly at home in Lu Jo. Yeah, and it's interesting your sort of emphasis on cocktails as the like market strategy because in China, of course, like aside from going into Capital Spirits, which is the bar that you were associated with in Beijing, there were not any other Chinese cocktail bar will not have baijiu as something that they're mixing with anything. I should say that Capital Spirits bar was opened by my business partners, but I was never involved in the day-to-day -day operations of that place. We formed a consultancy together later. But the bar was entirely the work of Matthias Hager, Bill Eisler, and Simon Dang. But before then, there weren't very many people working with Baijiu in the cocktail space. Baijiu was largely considered uh, a drink that you consumed exclusively with food. Sometimes it was consumed with medicine, where you'd have herbs, spices, things like snakes infused into your Baijiu and drank it for its health benefits. But in cocktails, no. You were working in China exclusively with Western spirits, broadly defined. So what they highlighted was basically as a way to introduce people who uh, weren't big fans of Baijiu or wanted to explore Baijiu without committing to an entire bottle, was a bar capital spirits that allowed you to two drinking paths. You could either try flights of different Baijiu, where you could try the four major categories of Baijiu one shot each and find out which style you like the best. Or you could try a variety of cocktails made with different styles of Baijiu. And this was a way of introducing people in a bit more of a soft way than you would with a Baijiu banquet where you would be surrounded by 10 people you work with gombaying you and asking you to drink one or two bottles with them until you got fall down drunk and had to be dragged out of the So we borrowed from this approach because we did find with my partner's experience running Capital Spirits in Beijing that a lot of people told them they were crazy when they started this. The expatriates told them they were crazy because they thought Baijiu was gross and nobody would go to a bar that focused on Baijiu. And the locals in Beijing told them that they were crazy because Baijiu wasn't served in cocktails. And, and that was weird. When they opened up, I think the clientele was about 75% expatriates going there for the novelty and the cocktails and about 25% local Beijingers. But within a year, that had flipped. And part of the reason for that, I think, was because there were a huge number of people in China who grew up drinking Baijiu in the traditional way, didn't really like the, the way of consuming it at the banquet table, essentially binge drinking Baijiu, but were interested in exploring it as a like domestic product that they could explore at their own leisure. So this was quite eye-opening and, and it also led to a lot of Chinese distilleries sending their representatives to Capital Spirits and asking them like what they were doing and how they could learn from this model because there has been a, in recent decades a bit of a generational gap between consumers of Baijiu where most baijiu in China is consumed by people who are over the age of 35 and drinkers under the age of 35 are drinking mostly other things. It's becoming a matter of increasing urgency for China, Chinese distillers to find a way to attract younger customers. And, and <laughs> this certainly uh, seems a, a promising path forward. Let's come back to Ming River for a second. So mm -hmm. who are your, what's been the breakdown between like bartenders trying to have fun and be cool in on the Lower East Side back when you could go into bars on the Lower East Side versus ethnic Chinese interested in exploring something different, folks being in China or just like total novelty seekers like finding you guys online. How is the, how has the split gone so far? 
it's hard to tell exactly who's buying it on the like customer to customer level because we just sell to the bars, to the restaurants and the liquor stores. And we know where it's being sold, but we don't know always who is buying it. Yeah. But I would say in general, like our clientele that just from like anecdotal experience and maybe our online store in the last several months after we opened it, it tells us that there's a pretty good mix of, I would say 30, 20, 30 somethings, even like early 40 somethings who tend to be middle, upper middle class, well-traveled, well-educated people. The the same kind of people who are fans of websites like eater.com, who are going looking for uh, new culinary experiences, who are interested in expanding their knowledge of Chinese food beyond the the Panda Expresses of the world and going to places where they can try something that's like a bit more traditional and closer to what you might be eating in China. For us, we know that we don't sell to a lot of the older mom and pop Chinese restaurants in in the United States, largely because those places don't have liquor licenses for the most part. By necessity, we mostly sell to uh, mid to high end restaurants that do have cocktail programs and are looking for innovative new ingredients and things to put them on the map, so to speak. And... For, for us, it's a pretty easy sell to this type of a restaurant because we'll go into these restaurants and for many of them, it's very important that they're presenting their customers with authentic Chinese ingredients, real Chinese dishes, flavors that are not necessarily Chinese American, but just Chinese. And very few of them have bottles of liquor from China on their liquor shelf. While it is true that in China, Baidu is not traditionally consumed as a cocktail ingredient, Baidu is always consumed in China with other flavors, whether that's food or whether that is like an infused ingredient in a a steeped cocktail. Baidu, by its very nature, is something that is meant to be combined with other flavors. Though this is a new use of Baijo for the most part, it's very much in keeping with the way Baijo is in, intended to be consumed. And I would also add to that, whiskey, rum, gin, these are all drinks that weren't used in cocktails and, until they were. Sure. So what's your you know, sense of the kind of adoption arc? Is this going to take a feature in James Bond to make it through to the mainstream? Like how is... How do you see this playing out over the next few years? I don't think Baijo product placement uh, in a James Bond movie is going to be the thing that, that pushes it over the edge. I think what we're doing and our approach since the beginning has been uh, very ground up and focused on education more than anything else. What I spend almost all of my time doing with Ming River is developing educational tools and teaching classes either to professionals in the liquor industry, to our salespeople, and even like down like at the individual like bar and restaurant level where I will go in and train their staff, teach them about Baijiu's history, how it's consumed in China, the different styles of Baijiu, so that they are empowered to present that information to their customers and and help them really contextualize what China is. Because my belief since the beginning with Baijiu has been that it is as good as any other global liquor. It's just most people lack the context to make sense of it. So if you can provide people with a framework that'll make it easier for them to appreciate it, then you've gone a long way into creating a space where Baijo can thrive. So we're going to close because you're married to a diplomat to ask you another sort of soft power question. Like, sure. to, to what extent does Western appreciation of more of China than pandas matter? What will it mean for the world for more people to have deeper understandings of things that matter a lot to Chinese, for instance, Baijo? Yeah, this is... This is a more philosophical question, and I don't, I can just speak for myself and what I think. But I think 
Baijo is a really interesting case study in terms of how we think about and approach other cultures, because it's one of those things that is casually dismissed by a lot of expatriates in China. Though alcohol itself is something that has tremendous cultural importance throughout Chinese history and throughout Chinese culture, its arts, its literature, its religion, its philosophy. So when you dismiss something like Chinese alcohol out of hand, you're being quite dismissive of Chinese cultural culture more broadly. So for me, I think. Accepting China by something that's harder to appreciate is a much better benchmark of how open the world is to accepting Chinese culture than panda bears, kung fu, tea, and maybe General Tso's chicken. Things that are very easy to appreciate on the surface level without really understanding anything about China. I think if someone says they appreciate a culture, but they can only appreciate the things that take no effort, then they don't actually appreciate that culture. That's my personal belief, and so I think what the future looks like for Baijo has a lot to do with the future of Sichuanese food or any other thing that's starting to make inroads、uh, outside of China. It's about a flavor. That is appreciated where it comes from, but isn't as well understood in other places. And the extent to which.